You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Stephanie Hafleybalt, the Deputy Director of Academic and Student Programs. And I'm thrilled to have you all here to talk about our new book, Applied Mainline Economics. You all have a copy of it at your chair. Um, if you didn't get a copy, there's some out front, as well as Mainline Economics, which looks at Nobel lectures to kind of continue the conversation. Applied Mainline Economics, Bridging the Gap Between Theory and Public Policy, was written by Matt Mitchell and Pete Becky. As part of the series for advanced studies in political economy that we do at Mercatus, that's edited by Virgil Storer and myself, uh, we're really excited to have this book come out because in many ways it's a primer of what we do at Mercatus and why it's important to do so. Um, so it's meant to be an overview of the schools of thought that we find important and also explain why those schools of thought are important to look at the real world and problems in the real world to solve them. Um, Matt Mitchell is the director of the Project for the Study of American Capitalism and a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. He got his PhD in economics from CMU and he himself bridges the gap between academia and policy uh, by doing academic research, testifying on the Hill, um, and working with state and local uh, policymakers. Dr. Peter Becky is the vice president of the Mercatus Center, the director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center, and is the university professor of economics and philosophy at GMU. He is also currently the president of the Southern Economic Association and the Mount Pelerin Society. Pete is a PhD, he got his PhD in economics from GMU and is an alumni of our programs. Uh, he's co-authored or authored 12 books and he works in academia, kind of fills that in practice by really thinking about our student programs and ways that we can train the next generation of students. Before I hand it over to Matt to give a brief presentation and then I'll facilitate a conversation between Matt and Pete and open it up for questions for you, I first wanted to say thanks to everyone at Mercatus that made this book possible. It's been years in the making, and we're all really excited to have it come out. Um, particularly, I want to thank Garrett Brown and his team for everything he did in the publication side. Everyone on SAMCAP and the ASP teams for what they did to get it out. And everyone who read it and gave feedback and kind of hoped that it would come out eventually as well. Um, so thank you all for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Excellent. Thank you all for coming here. I, I want to thank a few people. Uh, first and foremost, my co-author, Pete. Uh, Pete started teaching me about 15 years ago. Uh, and he's never stopped, uh, including in the process of writing this book. I learned uh, an enormous amount. Um, you know, that may make you nervous as a reader to learn that, you know, in some ways the, the writer is just like a few sentences ahead of you learning stuff, but uh, that's the way uh, writing actually works. Um, so uh, I want to thank Pete. I want to thank Richard Williams, uh, first of all, for, for being here. I, I, I really appreciate that, uh, but for really encouraging uh, the writing of this book. So. Uh, we have used the term toolkit for a long time, for as long as I can remember being at Mercatus, um, but we kind of needed to put some uh, meat to the bones to actually describe what do we mean by toolkit. Uh, so Richard really encouraged us to, to do this project, um, and he uh, was one of the many people who uh, helped us write it along the way. And then, of course, uh, to Stephanie and to Garrett's team and to the great uh, copy editing and just the whole, the whole process was really a great process. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do here for uh, just really 10 minutes here is kind of give you a little bit of background on, on sort of the title and what we mean by mainline economics. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to end by sort of teeing up what I think are the main elements of it. And then I, I hope really in the, in the back and forth discussion is where we're going we're to learn what those are. So the, the term mainline economics is, is a term that uh, Pete has now used for, uh, for several years. And really probably the best way to understand it is in contradistinction to the idea of mainstream economics, okay? So what is mainstream economics? Well, in a word, mainstream economics is whatever is fashionable, all right? It's uh, the current definition of just what's cool, right? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through two versions of what could be fashionable, okay? So uh, one version of what's fashionable right now is what uh, uh, Nobel laureate, um, Paul Gilles, I think is his first name, Koopmans. He actually is a distant relative of Chris Koopman. Uh, uh, what he described as measurement without theory. And so measurement without theory is this idea 
that if you want to understand the world, don't worry about theory, just, out, just go observe it, okay? Uh, but there are a lot of ways that you can uh, go wrong in just thinking that you can observe it. And by the way, this has become particularly popular in the last few years as we have more data sets, more sophisticated, way, sophisticated ways of testing them, uh, more sophisticated techniques. A lot of them sound really fancy, too. Uh, but just to give you a, a flavor of this, so here is a number of people who drowned by falling, by falling in a pool. Uh, correlates quite well with films uh, Nicolas Cage has appeared in. Um, maybe there's some causality. Maybe you could build a theory about why the, the two are related. But I suspect, actually, that just relying on measurement without theory isn't going to get you very far. Uh, divorce rates in Maine correlate quite well with per capita consumption of margarine. This doesn't surprise me. Margarine's awful. Um, uh, letters uh, in the winning word in the national spelling bee correlate with number of people killed by venomous spiders. I was sort of depressed how many of these correlations have to do with death. Uh, so. Uh, but actually, if you want to learn more, just look up, uh, just Google spurious correlations, and there's literally 30,000 uh, correlations <laughs> like this that are, you know, tightly associated, but uh, you don't have, uh, they, they have very little theory behind them. So what's wrong with this? Um, to give another one, um, police per capita correlates quite well uh, with uh, crimes per capita. So are police causing crimes? No. If you want to do sophisticated empirical analysis, you need to understand the relationship, which could be that something else is causing both crime rates in cities and police in cities. And in fact, the best empirical techniques rely on theory and, and are grounded in, in good theory because that's the only way you're going to make sense of things like those, those statistics. So we make the case that uh, good economics needs to be grounded in theory, which begs the question of what sort of theory. Well. Uh, let me give you a version of what I think probably should not be the theory. Um, and so one could call this theory without, uh, without reality. Now, that may be a little bit harsh because what I'm going to tell you, I think I, I believe part of it. And I, I teach it, and I think most economists teach it. But the problem is where you think that this is an absolute description of reality. So I'm going to talk uh, just, just a minute about the, the uh, perfectly competitive model in economics. Okay. So, uh, and if, if you, this is all foreign to you, don't worry because it's not, the, it, it's not the substance of what we're getting at. But the basic idea here is, okay, you've got a demand curve that slopes downward, you've got a supply curve that slopes upward, uh, and in a competitive market, uh, this sends a very special kind of signal to a competitive firm in the market, and they face uniquely a flat demand curve. Flat demand curves are really nice in, in math because a flat demand curve means you have a flat av uh, marginal revenue curve and you set any rational um, profit ma maximizing firm sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost and that happens at this spot right here. Uh, and then this is magical because back over in the market side, uh, a few things are true. Marginal cost equals marginal benefit. <coughs> put a little star there. This maximizes consumer and producer surplus. Going to put two stars there. And this means that the equilibrium is at the spot where uh, it's the minimum point on average total cost curve, right? Have I convinced all of you that markets are awesome with this? OK, so for a lot of people, this is the version of why markets are awesome. For a lot of people who both believe in markets and people who don't believe in markets. I don't think this is a terrible story. Uh, we had um, Israel Kersner here a few, a few years ago, and somebody asked about supply and demand curves. And he, they said, do, they, do these belong in economics? And he said, they, they belong at the beginning. You start the story here, but they shouldn't be the last thing. And one reason why they shouldn't be the last thing is that in this story, uh, I haven't talked at all about institutions. I haven't talked at all about how you get to the equilibrium. I haven't talked at all about the property rights or the rule of law or what it is that gets you there. And what's, what's a frustrating part about this is this story relies on a set of highly stylized assumptions that are designed to make the math work. It looks really sciencey, which is pretty cool, but when you go and you look at these assumptions, OK, so you need a lot of people. You need a lot of, a lot of buyers, a lot of sellers. You need homogeneous products. No transactions cost, no barriers to entry, no barriers to exit. Perfect competition about price, complete and perfectly enforced contracts. So you need all those conditions for the math to work out, right? And it doesn't take somebody like Paul Krugman 
in the New York Times uh, magazine in 2009, it doesn't take him many words to say that these are pretty unrealistic assumptions, right? And all you need to do is prove that a few of these assumptions aren't going to work and the math doesn't work, so therefore the, the theory must be bogus, right? Um, and of course, people do that, right? So what we argue is that this version of economics has really sort of lost its way and it's missing what should be the main line of economics. And the main line of economics, it's called the main line, and Pete can elaborate on this, because you can trace it all the way back to Adam Smith and actually even earlier. And it, it has three propositions about which we'll, we'll discuss essentially in the Q&A and with you guys uh, over the next, next uh, uh, few minutes. Uh, number one, it's that the market is a process. Okay, when you see that static supply and demand curve, you don't see entrepreneurs who are, who are moving uh, prices and quantities towards equilibrium. You don't see people who are disrupting markets and thinking of totally different ways of pleasing consumers and, and creating value for people. You don't see the process of specialization that happens over time as people gain expertise doing, doing things. Uh, you also don't even see the process of um, people discovering what it is that consumers want and what it is that the price ought to be. Uh, so, so number one, the market is a process. And we ground this in the idea uh, that it's all about exchange and that humans are unique in that, uh, as Adam Smith said, no one ever saw you know, one dog exchange a bone with another. And it is true that uh, humans really are, are quite unique as species that we exchange with unrelated members of our species. Not many other animals do this. Uh, in fact, uh, I think the only other example is uh, some chimpanzees ex exchange uh, sex for food, uh, and uh, probably some humans do that too, but we don't. Uh, <laughs> we exchange a lot of other things, right? So one is that the market is a process and it's about exchange. Two is um, culture and the institutions in which, things, in, in which we exchange influence that process of exchange. So go back to those earlier assumptions. They assume zero transactions costs. Well, that's... That's a big assumption, and then there's a lot of places in the world where there are not zero transactions costs. How do we get there? What, what dictates uh, transactions costs? They assume perfectly uh, enforced contracts. How do we get there? You can't just assume away the most important problems in economics. Some, the most impro important problems in economics are how do we get the institutions that promote uh, mutually beneficial exchange that is social, that, that where uh, one, one person trading with another leads to results that are beneficial for third and fourth and fifth people all around, right? How do you get there? Um, so embedded in that second assumption that culture and institutions shape that process is that some institutions and some cultures lead to uh, an invisible hand theorem. They lead to the idea that in seeking our own interest, we can benefit society. But an important corollary there is that some institutions and some cultures don't. So how does that happen? And that gets to the third, the third uh, point, which is that institutions themselves are the product of exchange. So um, we have laws, and laws are created by policymakers who happen to be people, and they, uh, an, an important part of that process is exchanging. They exchange votes. They exchange money. They exchange endorsements. They exchange words, lots and lots of words. And all of that exchange in the political setting uh, does not always lead to the best institutions to govern um, our interactions with one another. So I'm going to leave those three points up there uh, and then really kind of open it up to discussion and you guys can, can uh, delve deeper as, as, we, as we go. So thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Matt. As being the moderator, I get to ask my questions first, and then I will open it up for you guys to ask as well. I'm not going to ask questions kind of really detailed to the pages in the book, since a lot of people are getting it for the first time. At the end, I'll talk about how if you guys want to do reading groups and stuff with that, we can, we can uh, continue the conversation after today. Uh, but I have a couple of questions I want to kind of get at of how you guys are thinking about the ideas in the book and how we really take them as... Um, either people working at Mercatus wanting to do these things or potential students thinking they want to come research here and, and why this matters and why we think it matters um, in the real world. Um, so first I want to talk, have you guys talk a little bit more about those three main elements of, of mainline um, and really kind of think of, and kind of what those are that really stand out, the sort of what's maybe compare with some um, 
kind of mainstream ideas, you've mentioned a few, but that we're really kind of tackling or providing new answers to questions that mainstream economics thinks they have the answers to and it might be kind of not so much. So um, I don't know if, if which one of you guys want to take it first, but kind of okay. talking about those three propositions a little bit more. I'll try to talk, but you can cut me off if I go on too long. Mm -hmm. And I apologize Bye -bye. to everyone here. I've been fighting a cold for uh, quite a while. <clears throat> and I also, along with Matt, want to thank uh, Matt, uh, Stephanie, and Garrett, and also uh, in my acknowledgement um, to the book, I acknowledge Brian Hooks. Brian Hooks was a uh, program assistant uh, 15 years ago or so, and um, he's now the head of the Charles Koch Foundation. And uh, Brian started from those very humble beginnings and, and rose to the organization, and the whole time he sort of carried me along with it. Um, I came here in 1998. Brian joined in the early 2000s, and we brought, when I came here, I brought with me a connection to USAID that I was involved with at University of Maryland. And then, unfortunately, Mansur Olson passed away, and the people at University of Maryland didn't really understand what it meant to talk about institutions and development. Um, but the people at USAID at the time, this was all the rage. They wanted to talk about it, and they understood that I understood that. And so they decided to move a slice, a part of an existing grant by the way, you can imagine the academic angst over that one, uh, an existing grant to the University of Maryland and give us a slice of it. And Brian was the manager of that grant, and that started a thing called the Global Prosperity Initiative, which then eventually led to Enterprise Africa, um, which eventually then led to the, ironically, to the Gulf Coast Recovery Project, because we tried to take what we learned from those ideas to apply to what went on in the Gulf Coast Recovery. And, um, and, you know, and so forth and so on. And so this idea, by the way, of if you go back and look at old stationery from Mercatus or the old Center for the Study of Market Processes, you'll see that the M is not the symbol. What you'll see instead is a triangle. Now, for those of you who are into this, you understand where that triangle came from. It's Hayek's triangle of a capital structure in the economy. But the problem with symbols is that if no one understands what the hell you're putting, it's not <laughs> much of a symbol. This is some kind of postmodern version of a bridge, by the way, uh, which was when we re-envisioned what we were trying to do, our goal was to take the cutting ideas of academic research and bring them to bear on the pressing issues of public policy, and that Mercatus would provide that bridge. And that became the sort of way we understood the interactions between, say, what we do out in Fairfax and what you guys do here in Arlington, and the sy symbiotic relationship between the two, those two things. And that sort of drives what's going on here, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, you guys can see that and, and, and build on that. So I think that's, uh, just to get that out of the way, uh, uh, Stephanie asked me a question about mainline and mainstream. Uh, just as a, a matter of personal history, um, when I was teaching, when I first got out of George Mason, you have to put yourself in a little bit of a time machine. Um, I was a pretty cocky kid. And the reason why I was a cocky kid was because I wrote on the collapse of communism right when communism was collapsing. In fact, I won the Omicron Delta Epsilon, which is the honor society for economics. I won the best dissertation. Not the best dissertation at George Mason, best dissertation in the United States. And so I got to go to the AEA meetings and everything else like that. Um, it, it, for a time being, every place I gave a job talk, I got a job <laughs> offer uh, because I was in hot demand. It was the late 80s, communism's collapsing. I was the guy talking about it. So I ended up by going to New York University. Well, you know, communism collapsed and then the transition sort of didn't go so great uh, at different places. And I started getting involved in giving IHS talks. And I would go to IHS talks and then these kids would come up to me and say, but you're not a mainstream economist. And I'd think, oh, that's kind of interesting. I studied with a Nobel Prize winner. Did you? No. Remember, I was cocky. Uh, <laughs> I also studied with the, with the second John Bates Clark medal winner, Kenneth Boulding, who was one of my teachers. Did you? No. Uh, and then I studied with Gordon Tullock, who was a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association. Did you? No, no, no. So what the hell are you talking about? Like, I studied with academic royalty. You studied with who? 
you know, Willy Wonka, okay? <laughs> Buchanan and Bolding, by the way, Bolding always used this term, mainline economics. He wrote a great essay called After Samuelson, Who Needs Smith? So what is it that we miss from, from Adam Smith that, that Samuelson didn't incorporate? Well, it goes back to sort of aspects of these three points. The idea is that, as Buchanan stressed a lot in his work, is exchange should be the focus, not necessarily just optimization behavior. It should be exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. So the way to think about main, mainline economics is that y there's two sort of like basic core ideas in economics. One of them is that individuals pursue their own self-interest, however that's defined. And the other one is that Paris gets fed. Right? That is, is that there's some kind of mechanism by which we get advanced coordination of economic plans between agents without a central commander. Call that the invisible hand pro postulate, call the other one the, uh, or the invisible hand theorem, and the other one let's call the rational choice postulate. The question is, how do you derive the invisible hand theorem from the rational choice postulate? In mainstream economics in the 20th century, the way that you did that was to invoke a frictionless environment and hyper-rationality. Go back to Matt's conditions that he had in there. And what you do is you collapse one to the other. Okay? But that's not Adam Smith. It's not John Baptiste Say. It's not John Stuart Mill. And it's certainly not even Frank Knight, who was the person who invented the idea of the perfect competitive model, as a foil against to study the real world. Risk, uncertainty, and profit. Let's start in a world where we eliminate risk, we eliminate uncertainty, and thus we'd eliminate profit. But the point is to study why it is that profit emerges, right? That was what he was trying to do. It's only with Stigler and then Samuelson and post-World War II economics that we ended up by getting this model so constructed and the Arohan de Bru model as the sort of pinnacle of that intellectual achievement. But the alternative people, Ronald Coase, you know, Doug North, uh, Israel Kirzner, um, even Vernon Smith, who began his career studying excess demand theory, not necessarily experiments. The experiments come on the heels of him being a micro theorist, actually. Um, they sort of looked at this idea of a groping market. How is it that markets sort of dovetail over time to this? And that requires certain institutions, institutions in particular, property, contract, and consent. So unless you have these institutions of property, contract, and consent, individuals pursuing their own self-interest are not going to end up by generating the invisible hand. And that's in Adam Smith, a classic example of Adam Smith, uh, to give you this idea of, re of uh, sort of why institutions matter, is Smith's comparison of professors in Oxford and professors in Edinburgh. Both were homo professornomicus. They want to, you know, maximize their income with the least amount of effort in their teaching. So they're homo professor nomicus. But the way that the professor in Edinburgh, it was, they were paid by student fees. So the professors in Edinburgh were in fact, in Glasgow, were in fact very, very dynamic and engaging with their students. The professors in Oxford were paid by an endowment. So they just read their books in front of the students. And they didn't actually do anything. So Smith makes fun of them. Note that it wasn't the behavioral characteristics that determine how the professor behaves in Oxford versus in, uh, in, in Glasgow. It's actually the institutional environment under which they interact. That generates different outcomes. So the analytical framework is same players, different rules produce different games. <laughs> Right? That's how Adam Smith contrasted capitalism with mercantilism. He didn't call it capitalism at that time, but markets with mercantilism. That's how John Baptiste de Say describes Say's law of the market and when it is that maybe you might have things that lead to Say's law of the market awry. Right? It's in institutions. It's not that people had animal spirits or anything like that. And so what we try to do is, is sort of lay out that kind of recapture that idea and who are the modern adherents of that main line of economics that reaches all the way back to the classical economists and carries forward with the early neoclassical economists and into the modern sort of institutional revolution in economics. And so part of what I want to sort of a message that I want to give to all of you is that you should be very, very proud as economic analysts of the economics tradition that you're working with. It is the classical heritage of what it means to be an economist from Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill.
It is the modern version of, ne of neoclassical economics that has won multiple Nobel Prizes. So this is not some unicorn that you're chasing. You hunt big game, and you hunt big game with the best arrows in your quiver. And those include the development of property rights economics, the development of law and economics, development of public choice economics, and the development of Austrian economics. And you're, you're working in the heritage of Hayek, Buchanan, Coase, North, Smith, and Eleanor Ostrom. That is a pretty damn good heritage to work with. It's a lot better than just Joe Blow, who's working with some macro model and some large data set and thinks that they somehow have like, I don't know, I got big data, so therefore I can plan around you, all right? So as Matt says, part of the things that we did in the beginning of the book was actually going through in the empirical engagement. This is one of the things you hear all the time nowadays is that you know there's a credibility revolution in econometrics, there's big data, you combine the two of them together and whoop, lo and behold, we don't have to worry about those old theoretical debates. And our whole argument is very similar to, in fact, appropriating a line that um, J James Heckman actually <coughs> forces, the pinnacle of, of the kind of econometrics approach. And Heckman says, at the end of the day, you have to adjudicate between these competing explanations. And what grounds do you adjudicate on? Sound economic theory. That is mainline economics. And so that's a kind of, you know, to begin. I have one other point that I'd like to make, and then I'll be quiet for now. I'm not that, that's probably a bad thing. But anyway, <laughs> uh, political economy is a value-relevant discipline only to the extent that we approximate value freedom in our economics. This is important to make a distinction between economic analysis and economic institutional design. Institutional design is a normative project. So Buchanan's constitutional political economy is going to be a normative project. But economic analysis, straightforward, is just simply means ends analysis. And you take the ends of the policy proponent as given, and you assess the efficiency of their chosen means to achieving their chosen ends. That's the grand tradition of economics. It's not a battle over ends, okay? You're not, you know, we're, we, we are examining, and go back and to use another example, Father Sadowski, who was a, a uh, uh, Jesuit priest that taught at Fordham for many years, he used to refer to this as the devil's test. If you could get a devil and an angel to agree on the analysis, then you know the analysis is value, relatively value-free, right? And uh, what I mean by that is, like, take, uh, again, Adam Smith and David Hume debating whether or not the state should sponsor religion. Hume hated religion, okay? Just thought we had to get rid of religion. Smith actually thought religiosity was valuable. In the debate at the time, of whether or not the state should fund religion, who do you think sided on which side? Remember what Smith said about teachers. So Hume wanted preachers that looked like the professors at Oxford. They would be boring, you know? Today, we are here for marriage. <laughs> That's a reference to the Princess Bride, right? <laughs> OK. So Hume was in favor of state sponsorship of religion. Smith was in favor of religious competition. But their analysis of why, the devil and the angel, right, was because of the economic consequences of the incentives that were generated from it. So that's economics, means ends analysis, which means the relationship between public choice and economics is a very interesting one. Because in analysis, public choice comes in as a second round of the bite of the apple after you've exhausted the effort to try to explain why the chosen means are not sufficient to obtain your ends. Because you're not trying to impart to the ends the idea that people are trying to benefit themselves at the expense of others. No one really says that in public policy, right? They don't come in and say, I want to pass this law because it benefits me and screws everyone else, right? Instead, they say, I want to pass this law because it's going to help the benefit, the least advantage in society to the greatest of heights that we've ever had before. 
And so what you have to do as an economist is say, okay, that's what you want to achieve. These are the means that you're choosing to obtain that. Those means are incentive incompatible with those ends. But if they continue to insist, then you have the right to say, oh, wait a minute, hold on a second. We infer intentions from outcomes. So really, you must not actually try to help the least advantage. You're trying to help this one. And that's where public choice comes in. So public choice is secondary in the analysis, but it's primary in the institutional design. Because you have to bake public choice concerns, that is, opportunism with guile, into any proposed institutional design of public policy, because otherwise your policy is going to be vulnerable to opportunism by the actors within it. And so it's that kind of dance between, in, in many ways, corresponding with Buchanan's two levels of analysis, okay, where you have the economics and you have political economy in, or social philosophy and the interactions of those produces what we call political economy. It's that kind of dance that we all sort of need to be trained in as we address these kind of issues. And I think Matt and, and I try to do that in this book um, and present that kind of argument uh, going forward. And one last thing about the book, which I, I really want to thank Garrett for doing, and Matt knows this, I love her, uh, you know, Hirschleifer's Intermediate Microtext. And one of the things that I love about it is little blue boxes. So when Matt and I were doing this, I kept on saying, we got to put the little blue boxes in there in order to make sure we had the applications, right? Because then that shows the power of the approach. Well, what ended up by happening is they're like gray, the little gray sections. So if you're flipping through the book and you look at the gray sections, you don't want to read all the stuff about like economic theory or whatever, just go to the gray sections and you'll see the applications. And then maybe that will entice you to go back and look at the theory. But at least you already have the applications there and the power of economic reasoning in the application to policy. Anyway, thank you. And yeah. Um, so I have a follow-up question. All right, <laughs> so I have a follow-up question for Matt, and it gets to what you were talking about, about sort of the, the chalkboard economics, mm -hmm. uh, the supply and demand curve, uh, and how that goes astray if we take it too far in studying reality, but how it can be helpful in teaching somebody about economics. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Kersner talks about how it should be at the start. Mises talks about how it's in the classroom. This one demand curve is important to kind of illuminate the world to people. But how do you navigate <coughs> that, particularly when you're looking at policy questions? What exactly does research look like in the, main, in the mainline uh, tradition? Mm -hmm. If you could have maybe some examples that can help people see this is what you do as a researcher that really follows this advice. Sure, so, um, okay, so what I like about that diagram and like I say, I, I use it in class, uh, is it, it does get at the idea that exchange is mutually beneficial. You can see consumer surplus and you can see producer surplus. People gain from exchange. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, it also gets at the idea that generally there's an incentive to try to make things better. But this is the part where I think it misses it, is it doesn't tell you who, get, who makes things better. It doesn't tell, what this doesn't tell you is that if there's a problem here and you're not maximizing the gains from exchange, an entrepreneur has an incentive to fix the problem. Somebody can profit from it. So here, let me give you the classic example, uh, asymmetric information. So if one side of the market doesn't know, know as much about the market as the other side, those with the superior information, um, by one version of this, they can take advantage of the others. The other version of this is just that, uh, Trade doesn't happen because you don't have no way of trusting one another, okay? So you can just look at this diagram and say, okay, well, trade's not maximizing, um, asymmetric information means that we're not maximizing the gains from exchange, it's inefficient, so we gotta regulate it. Well, uh, Adam Thierer uh, and others have shown, uh, actually, uh, in the real world, entrepreneurs have profited handsomely by closing those asymmetric, uh, symmetries of information by empowering consumers through everything from uh, you know handheld devices to uh, rating systems uh, to geolocational uh, data that allows you to make sure that your taxi driver isn't taking you through a circuitous route to the uh, strip in, in Las Vegas or whatever uh, you know we have an entrepreneur can change that process so that's really where I think it, it misses it is it doesn't tell you how you get to the equilibrium it doesn't tell you 
how certain in, uh, institutions shape people's incentives to move you to the closer, uh, you know, more efficient outcome. Uh, so I have one more question. Something that we haven't talked about as much so far today, but is a theme that happens through these scholars in the mainline tradition, is this strong desire for humility when thinking about what we can engineer for other people and also the limits to what we have for kind of impacting policy and, and, and providing social change. Uh, Hayek in his Nobel lecture says this explicitly, um, that you know, sort of this, this quest we can get on to make an impact can sometimes lead to uh, this pretense of knowledge. And so having the tools of mainline economics brings a whole new set, but with that we also have this uh, strong warning that says be humble and be cautious about what you do. How do you think, how do we think about that in the day to day as we're going about our job and what does that really mean for how we think about influence, influencing policy and what we think about influencing others going into this field of what we can really do? Mm -hmm. um, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, so uh, I would like to point out that Eleanor Ostrom as well in her Nobel Prize address is very explicit on this issue. Um, and it ties back to her husband Vincent's work on the intellectual crisis of public administration and the substitution of the democratic administration to bureaucratic administration um, and what that entails. And I think that, that story is a very important story about how economics evolved away from the main line uh, was because we had a transformation of public administration. Public administration is actually one of the main uh, employers of economists. So the demand side was there and the supply side responded to that. Um, and we instead had economists who are now trained to be bureaucratic administrators. And all you have to do to realize that is look at the number of independent regulatory agencies that have evolved in the 20th century. They did not exist in the 19th century. They're all part of the 20th century and they became major employers of economists that are supposed to do something, which was to manage an economy and even more to manage an economy irrespective of democratic pressures. You have to understand that's the point of the independent regulatory agencies. They're not subjected to democratic uh, deliberation. They are in fact trained experts that are supposed to be put in charge and that changes the dynamics of the way we train economists. What it also is what is the tools necessary to be able to do that, which is that economics, in fact, is a planning. It's a tool of social control, not a tool of social criticism and of understanding. And that transformation, Adam Smith used to make fun of the man of systems, right? In the famous Invisible Hand passage, if you read right, uh, you know, above it, what he says is that uh, this would give, you know, that individuals should be allowed to decide what to do with their own capital. And he says, any effort to tell them how to direct their own capital would not only load the administrator, the Senate, or whoever with knowledge that they don't have, presume they had knowledge that they had, but also load them with authority that can't be trusted in them. And in fact, he says, would nowhere be as dangerous as in a man who fancied himself fit for this task, okay? So Smith demanded humility as well, and that comes all the way through. So what does this lead to? It leads to policy that focuses, as we talk about in the book, on predictable rules. So you wanna have rules versus discretion in your policy. So imagine, again, you're running the Fed, but you're running the Fed according to the rule of law, right? Not according to some kind of optimal you know, policy of central bank policy for discretion. So it's a move away from discretion, more towards rules, a more uh, restrained notion of setting the environment. Um, you know, uh, think about Adam's work, uh, going back to this, what's the difference between a precautionary principle, right? Imagine if we tried to actually have all innovations pass through a precautionary principle, we'd still be in a buggy, right? That's the problem now. Instead, if we have like a rule of law that sets up and people can in fact engage in all kinds of innovations, some of which fail, a large part of them fail actually, some of which succeed, that's how we learn through this process. And so the process itself is what teaches us. But if we do engage in institutional design, we have to remember that we're in an imperfect world with imperfect human beings designing imperfect institutions. So those one size fits all which is one of the reasons why you maybe want to push down to the polycentric 
ideas of local experimentation to, to do that so we can continue to learn. But if we're going to do this, we're not going to make assumptions of omniscience. We're not going to make assumptions of benevolence. And we're going to bake that into the way we do our institutional design. And we're always going to think in terms of incentive compatibilities. Right? What are the incentive compatible policies and what are the incentive compatible strategies for implementing those policies? And that's the only way we can kind of wrap our heads around these kind of ideas rather than the idea that we know exactly. So for those of you who studied economics, understand the full thrust of the pretense of knowledge. Just go and look at a simple Keynesian cross. <laughs> that's all you have to do. Simple Keynesian cross. It told you where it is that you have a deficient aggregate demand. That gave you an unemployment equilibrium. You know what the full employment level of output would be. You know that. You know exactly the amount of G that you need to increase in order to work through a multiplier, which you know what the percentage of that multiplier is in order to be able to get that. That's a different tool than even this supply and demand analysis. Right? This is an attempt to orchestrate, or as Hayek says, you know, this is the constructivist urge, even in sort of the macro policies. But one of the th key things, again, in the Keynesian system was there's no incentive compatibilities working all the way through. Right? It was the trained expert could pick, and the citizen was a passive citizen that just responded. And so once we start the interaction effects of the incentives that everyone faces, all that stuff goes away, and we end up with these destabilized environments. And so this is one of the things that we care about. Yeah. Uh, great. So please join me in thanking Matt and Pete for the book. Oh. And the Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the F.A. Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.